Good morning students, I am GS Suresh back again to teach you design of RCC structural elements 10 CV 52. I am teaching in National Institute of Engineering which I told you yesterday. I am teaching you the unit 1 general features of reinforced concrete from previous class. Yesterday I teach taught you the reinforced concrete. What is the reinforced concrete? What is a concrete? Why do we use rebars? As I told you we are using the rebar to take care of tensile stresses developed in the structure. Concrete is a ma manufactured material using cement, aggregate, water and admixture. Concrete is strong in compression and weak in tension. Steel in the form of bars called as rebars are used in structure. High strength steel are generally used. We will learn more properties of the material in the coming classes. The guidelines given in Indian Standard Code 456 published in 2000 year is used for designing the reinforced concrete structures. Various forms of structures like frame structure, bridges, water tanks have in introduced you in the previous class. Reinforced concrete structure should resist the load acting on it. So, today we are going to see the loads which I had briefly told you in the previous class. Objective of today's class is to teach you the loads, design philosophy, limit state design principles. What is load? Friends, the load is the one in which the forces act on a member in a large intensity is called as the loads. The load considered for designing a structure is called design loads. The static and dynamic loads are acting on the structure. The force which acts gradually and act for a long time is called static load. The load which varies along with the time is called as the dynamic load. The dynamic load is produced due to various elements like it could be an earthquake, wind or it could be due to a machine component. Now we shall consider the static force. The static force is divided further into three parts. One is called as the dead load which is fixed in the structure like the self weight of different components. Then we have the live load which are variable, that, but they are not variable with the time. It may act for short time, then it may be discontinued which is applied gradually and after some time it may repeat. The forces due to settlement, thermal effect, residual stresses etcetera are also considered as static load. The live load can be further classified as occupancy load that is if you are using on a particular building your weight is considered as live load. Then environmental load like snow and water which acts on the structure is also called as the live load. Why we consider this as a live load? As you know snow can be expected only during winter, but during the summer it would not be acting. Hence it is a live load. Then the dead load could be self weight and also the fixed building elements may be the some part partition wall or it could be fixtures in your toilet or it could be a fixture in your kitchen or it could be fixtures in your living room. These are all the dead loads. Coming to the dynamic load, 
we have two types of dynamic load. One is completely vibrating or continuous, which would be oscillating uniformly or irregularly. Another is sudden load. The load applied within zero time almost is called impact load. It could be sudden application of brake in your vehicle, which may cause an impact on the bridges. Then coming to the continuous dynamic load, it is the internal or the inertial forces caused due to earthquake or maybe due to wind force. This is the classification of the loads. We shall study in detail how the loads are to be considered in the structure. Before we design, we should know the loads. Why we should know the loads? Because using the loads and geometry of a structure, we determine the internal forces like bending moment, shear force, torsion, axial forces, etc. First, let me consider the dead load. As I already indicated to you, it is the weight of the members may be beam, slab, column, itself weight is a dead load. The weight of the fixed elements as already I have told you could be partition wall etc., floor finishes or it could be fixed equipments in your building can cause the dead load. It can be calculated accurately. If you know the volume multiplied by the density gives you the dead load or the self weight. So, what do you require to calculate the dead load? The volume of a member and the density. The volume of the member can always be calculated. Most of the building ele elements will have a definite geometry like it could be a cuboid or it could be a sphere for which you have the formula. For example, if it is a cuboid, you can multiply length, breadth and depth to get the volume. As you know, the density is the unit weight that is the weight per unit volume which gives you the density. Where do I get the density of different materials? Can I measure all? No need. There is a Indian standard code for this. It is called IS 875, Indian Standard Code 875, which is being published in 1987 or revised in 1987. The part 1 of this gives you the unit weight. I have an extract of this shown to you here. This will show you the weight of different materials like metal, concrete. If you take a plain concrete, the weight in SI unit expressed as kg per meter cube is 2307, which we approximate to 2400 in our calculation. If it is a lightweight concrete, it is 1201 to 1762. If it is a reinforced concrete, it is 2402. Like that you have got for steel which is 7849 kg per meter cube. You have got all other materials listed here. So, what I suggest for you from the next class is always when you attend the class hold two code books and one special publication with you, so that you can understand our teaching easily. Which are those? One is IS456. 2000. You can get a copy from Bureau of Indian Standard situated in Bangalore, Pinya. You can contact and get this. Another one is IS 875. In five parts, you may require first, second and third part for this course. Then you can have special publication 16. So, keep always with you these three codes which will help you to understand whatever we teach you. The table 2 shows the loading per meter squared due to standard materials like maybe Mangalore tile which is giving 0.64 kilo Newton per meter squared. Cement asbestos sheet gives you 0.83 k 
kilo Newton per meter squared and country tile which is made out of clay gives you 0 0.69. Other floors walls is listed here. This is an extract from IS 875 part 1. So, you have understood what is a dead load is. Let us understand the live load. Live load as I said is a static load, but it acts for a short time. It may repeat after some time and it does not act all the time. It is gradually applied load, it is not a dynamic load. For example, the weight of persons using a structure furniture, stored materials for short time are all live loads. Sometimes it becomes very difficult to predict this magnitude. So, this can be done using IS 875 part 2, which gives you for buildings what should be the live load we should consider. This uses empirical approach. Several investigators have done work on this in the early 1970s and they have published what should be the load. Based on this investigation, we have arrived in IS 875 the loads. The design loads corresponds to the peak load. That means, see for example, during a festival in your house, you may be more number of people arrive living at a particular floor. So, that is the peak load which we should consider as the design load, not the one which is small during the day to day. For example, in your house you are only three members, but on a particular festival day or a function in your house more people may gather. So, always we take the worst case to calculate the live load. As I said, Part 2 gives you the loads on floors and roofs separately. Few of the floor loads which are generally used in buildings I have indicated here. For residential buildings, you can take normally as 2 kilo Newton per meter squared as the live load on floors. For balconies, staircases and toilets, because there you will have more live load, you can take 3 kilo Newton per meter squared. If it is a roof, we divide it into two parts. If you have provided an access to the roof through staircase, it is called accessible. Many of your houses, you may have the staircase going to your terrace. So, that is called as accessible staircase. In some houses, you will not be providing any access to your rooftop, you will be having only a ladder for maintenance purpose that is called as inaccessible roof. For that you should take the load as 0.75 kilo Newton per meter squared. For designing the column or the wall or a big column called as the pier or their supports, the imposed floor load can be reduced depending on the number of floors you have. Anyway, this is not the point to insist on how the reduction to be made. When you study on the designing of multi-storied building, we will tell you more about this. Apart from the two loads which I told you in the static load that is live load and the dead load, we have the loads acting perpendicular to the structure called as lateral loads. The structure subjected to live load and dead load are generally considered as the vertical loads. The lateral loads can be applied onto the building because of the nature. This induces large magnitude of moment. Friends, you consider a building as a tall vertical cantilever. When the lateral force acts on the building, it induces moment. Let us try to understand this on the board through this figure. You can see, suppose you consider this as a building which I write in a single line and this is being fixed at the bottom 
and you apply a horizontal force and this is the height of the building H and you are applying the force P. Then you will induce a moment at the base which is equal to P into H. So, that means to say the height of the building at the top if you are applying a force in the lateral direction that induces large moment. So, lateral loads are critical in case of the buildings. It as acts as a vertical cantilever. So, that is why the lateral loads are more dangerous on the building than the vertical loads. So, we have to be very careful while designing tall structures. These forces in the idealization is done on the joints that is idealization. I told you in the previous class what is idealization? Idealization is assumptions we made on the actual structure is called idealization. We have two major forces considered in practice for lateral loads they are called as wind force and earthquake force or it is also called as seismic force. These are all applied on the building. Now, I am trying to explain you very briefly it itself is a subject. So, I very briefly explain you the wind force. Due to the difference in atmospheric pressure at different layers in atmosphere, the wind is created. How do we know the wind is blowing? This diagram shows you the tree is waving out. You can see because of the wind this tree is bent. So, that I have shown there how the forces are changing along the stem. So, uh, and on the right side you can see the building has tilted because of the wind and you can also see during hurricane that is a large amount of wind is called hurricane that is causing the wind to deflect the tree and then also here at the bottom you can see how the water in the sea is getting affected due to whirlpool. So, you can see how these effects are happening. So, let me explain you what is wind forces. It is the motion of the air relative to the earth surface that is called as the wind force. It can, it can act in a three dimensional status but we can always take the components of the wind out of this horizontal component will have large magnitude. The vertical component will have less. So, if you consider this as a three dimensional force you will have the horizontal force dominating in case of the wind force. The wind pressures act horizontally on the exposed surfaces. As I told you the wind is caused due to difference in the atmospheric pressure. How do we measure this? We use what is called as anemometers and then we plot anemographs installed at 10 to 30 meters in the field above the earth surface which measures the wind velocity. So, wind force is calculated indirectly from the velocity from your engineering mechanics where you studied the force as f is equal to m into a from that you can use always to calculate the force. So, a means acceleration. So, acceleration is related to velocity from the velocity you can calculate the force. All the exposed surface of the structure are affected due to the wind force. If you have seen the buildings which are situated in a field, if it has got a glass, this glass gets very often broken. It may be probably in your college, if it is situated in the outskirts, you may see without any other effects due to wind, the glass may break because the pressure on the glass exceeds the strength of the glass, that is why it breaks. Liability depends on geographical location and proximity of other obstructions. 
So, as I said if your building is in the outskirts it will be subjected to more wind pressure. If it is within a city wherein there are many other structures which will barricade your structure and it will not be subjected to more wind force. Combined external and internal pressures sometimes if you have got a window the wind passes through the window and then it may apply internal pressure. So, the difference in external and internal pressure causes sufficient damage to the structure. Wind produces three different types of effects on the structure. One is static, dynamic and aerodynamic effects. The code IS 875 part 3 gives you the basic wind pressure or wind velocity that is we call it as wind speed and this is called as peak gust velocity. That means, for several years using anemometers the wind velocity has been recorded and averaged and given out. This will give you the velocity of a particular place. This is indicated in IS 875 part 3. In India we have 6 zones with the basic wind speed 33 meters per second, 39 meters per second, 44, 47, 50 and 55. If you are located in Bangalore or Mysore you can take the wind velocity maximum as 33 meters per second. This graph shows the extract from IS 875 part 3. Here the different color indicates the different velocities. So, that is how the basic wind speed indicated as V B in the code is given here. Then there are several theories which is at this time is not necessary to calculate the design speed and design pressure of the wind. So, only you should know in this course what is a wind forces, how it acts, it acts as a lateral load that is horizontal load. Another lateral force which you must have seen in India particularly in Gujarat when in 2001 it was affected many buildings called as the earthquake which is also called as seismic force. Why the earthquake occurs? An earthquake occurs because of sudden tremor or movement in the earth crust. As you know earth has got a center portion called crust wherein as the earth is moving inside the materials will be keep on moving. If there is a small defect in the earth crust it may slide it is called shear failure. This induces vibration on the surface of the earth which will be again a vector in the space. If you take the component of this vector, its horizontal component is more like in wind, its vertical component intensity is very less. So, that is why it is considered as lateral force which induces a horizontal force at the bottom of the structure. This force is called as base shear. The IS 1893 which is published in 2002 the part 1 of this code describes the method of analysis how to consider the force on the structure due to earthquake. The base shear which I told you is the total horizontal force acting at the bottom of the structure that is on the foundation. Then this induces vibration into the building. The base shear is distributed along the height that means, the forces will get transmitted through your structure to the top. So, the top force will induce maximum bending moment as I have explained earlier. This graph shows the zones depending on what is the amplitude of vibration that takes place on the structure is divided into 4 zones in India. Earlier there were 5 zones, later in 2002 the Indian code has made it as only 4 zones. 
earlier it was called zone 1 has been removed. Now the starting is zone 2, zone 3 then zone 4 and zone 5. Most of the part of Karnataka is in zone 2, some part of North Karnataka is in zone 3 and zone 4. Now this force has to be applied on the reinforced concrete structure. Next we shall go to the next part of our lecture on the design considerations. You have got to introduce to the design considerations, safety, serviceability, safety avoids collapse, serviceability avoids excess deformation. What do you understand by serviceability? If you have a beam in your house, if you find a big sag in your structure which is bent like this, then you scare, you get scared because of the deflection. So, the deflection should not induce any scare to the user, he should not be panic. To make the structure more safety, it should be serviceable, that means to say the deflection should be as less as possible. Increasing the design margins of safety can enhance the safety and serviceability. There are two aspects in design, one is the strength, how strong is your structure, second is how much deflection takes place in your different components of the structures. Various philosophies has been studied for last 100 years starting from 1900. In the beginning of uh, 20th century, people thought concrete or reinforced concrete is like steel only is a homogeneous material. They were using what is called as elastic theory. What is elastic? If stress is directly proportional to stress, then it is called as elastic member. That method is called working stress method in which stress is directly proportional to strain. This was uh, accepted up to almost 1950s. In India up to 1960 we used this theory. Then many researchers found that concrete is not a homogeneous material, it is a heterogeneous material consisting of concrete and steel, it is a composite material. So, its behavior is different, it is a non-linear curve which gives for stress strain. Hence, they called that theory as ultimate theory because in this theory we were using the force causing the failure of the structure which is called as ultimate load. So, that method is called ultimate load design. Later in the ultimate load they found that the structure design used to deflect large and it was not giving a serviceable condition to the structure. Hence, they used a mathematical theory called as probabilistic st and statistic analysis and this method of design is called limit state design. In the world almost uh, many countries followed right from 60s, but in India we introduced this in 1978. The code IS 456 published in 1978 had the limit state design and later carried it to the IS 456 published in 2000. So, now whatever the design we do, we do it by limit state method and I abbreviate this as LSM. LSM is limit state method of design. Briefly, I explain you working stress method. Earlier days, we used to design the structure only by this concept of elastic analysis. In this method, we assume the following, 
Number one, a section is plane before and after bending. That means to say the stress strain curve is linear and second the section which is rectangle is considered as rectangle even after bending. If you see through the microscope which may not be true, but it is to a small extent it may warp, but that we ignore. Then the materials are assumed to be linear, the stress strain curve is straight line which is not true. And we also assume in working stress method or in all methods that there is a perfect bond between steel and concrete. This is the basic requirement of concrete structure that is reinforced concrete structure. We also use a terminology called as modular ratio which is the ratio of Young's modulus of steel to Young's modulus of concrete that is ES by EC. But the code gave us different empirical formula called as 280 by 3 into sigma CBC, where sigma CBC is the stress in concrete under bending in compression. So, C first stands for concrete, next letter B stands for bending, the third one C stands for compression. This gives you slightly different value than what you calculate from E s by E c, E stands for Young's modulus. Then the stress due to worst combination of load should be less than the permissible stress. What is permissible stress? Yield stress divided by a factor of safety is called permissible stress. If you recall your laboratory work in basic material testing lab that is strength of material slab, there we taught you how to calculate the working stress. First you measure on a steel specimen the yield stress, then you divide by a suitable factor of safety to get the working stress. This ensures that at no point of time the stress in the member will not reach the yield stress. So, that is why we use factor of safety. This indicates how we calculate the forces in different part of the rectangular section. On the top of the neutral axis it is compression, below the neutral axis is tension. Here you can see this is a strain diagram, the topmost fiber in a simply supported beam will be subjected to compression that is in sagging bending moment and it will have the maximum strain which is I call it as epsilon c. Then at the bottom you have epsilon st. So, that is why one is positive another is negative. In this diagram you can see the curve is coming on to the left side of the vertical line indicating that it is tension that is about the strain. The third diagram called as the stress distribution often we call it as stress block, which has got the stress corresponding to the strain epsilon c is called sigma CBC. Sigma is a Greek letter used for the stress and uh, I have already told you what is CBC stands for. And you can see below the neutral axis I have drawn the line with the dotted line that indicate that the stress induced below the neutral axis is ignored. We are not considering because it is very small, one tenth of the compression. So, we only take whatever the force induced in the compression zone as C, that is the area of the triangle multiplied by the area of rectangle above the neutral axis. Below, the tension is totally taken by the reinforcement which I have called it as AST here and AST multiplied by sigma ST. Sigma ST is the stress in steel under tension. So, there S stands for steel, T stands for tension. So, if you multiply stress into area gives you the tensile force T. 
the factor of safety is used on the yield load or ultimate load or ultimate stress which gives you permissible stress factor of safety is used to see that the structure never reaches the ultimate value now i can represent the working stress method as resistance r divided by factor of safety fs which should be more than the applied load L. It is very natural. Any material should have the resistance more than the applied load. To tell you an example, suppose I have a capacity to lift 20 kg. If I lift even 20.1 kg, I may break my hand. So, I should not lift any material up to 20 kg. Say, I will restrict it to up to 15 kg. That means, I am applying a factor of safety factor of safety is used on the ultimate strength to obtain the permissible stress. The permissible stress is the one in which I get the stress less than the yield stress. The factor of safety is used to account for uncertainties in materials. I can represent the resistance R divided by factor of safety F s to be greater than the applied load. Friends, we can imagine like this. I have a capacity to lift about 20 kg. If I lift even 20.1 kg, I may break my hand. So, I should not allow myself to lift 20 kg. Say, I want to lift only up to 15 kg. So, 20 divided by 15, whatever the value you get, that is called as factor of safety. So, this factor of safety is very essential to take care of the structure to be safe. Some disadvantages are there in the method that is why it is discontinued. Actually, if you refer to the stress strain diagram of concrete, it is not linear. Right from the beginning of application of the load, it is non-linear. So, it is not representing the actual fact it does not account for uncertainties. We are manufacturing the concrete at the site. So, we cannot manufacture all the time the same quality. There must be some variations in the quality. To account for this, we should have certain factors. And also, it does not account for creep and shrinkage. Because of these disadvantages, and found that the members designed are over safe or it is called conservative. That is why this method was discontinued. Very short period, another method called as ultimate load method was available. This method was using the nonlinear stress strain diagram given by several investigators. And in this, we were looking at how the building is to fail. Based on the study on the failure, we used to design the structure. For this, we are not using factor of safety. The same thing is called load factor. Suppose, you are applying a force 20 kg. You design the structure for 30 kg. That means, a factor of 1.5 was applied on the structure or the load, then we were getting the ultimate load. The earlier principles given by a famous scientist called Whitney, his theory is very popular. He has given a stress strain diagram to be used in the design. Then later, he converted this into a rectangular. Earlier, it was parabolic stress strain diagram, he converted into rectangle called as equivalent stress diagram. And 
the ultimate strain in the concrete was 0.3 percent that means as you know strain is equal to change in length divided by virginal length that value is 0.003 in concrete. So, this uh, diagram shows you a rectangular beam which is having a reinforcement at the bottom and this is the strain diagram as in the case of working stress method, but you can see the stress strain diagram at 0 strain it is 0 stress and then the stress is varying parabolically to the maximum value of sigma C u which is called as parabolic stress strain curve and the area of this curve multiplied by the area of the rectangle above the neutral axis gives you the compressive force. And at the bottom you have no stress in the concrete you have got the stress only in steel which is called tensile stress. Tensile stress multiplied by the area of steel at the time of failure that is ultimate is called tensile force. The distance between C and T is called liver arm. Whitney gave a equivalent rectangular stress block such that the area of this rectangle is equal to area of this parabola. So, that it makes convenient idealization again is done to get the design formula. In the ultimate load method, we use a slightly modified view called as the resistance R should be greater than load factor multiplied by L. In working stress method, I was having R divided by factor of 50. Now, I am having R should be greater than actual load multiplied by the load factor. IS 456-1964 specified the ultimate load in the following way. The ultimate load is represented as U which should be 1.5 times dead load plus 2.2 times live load. That means to say I had the load factor different for dead load and different for live load. So, for live load it is 2.2 and for dead load it is 1.5. When you are considering the wind load or earthquake load, it was to be 0.5 you have to consider or you have to also check for 1.5 times dead load plus 0.5 times live load plus 2 times either wind load or earthquake load. What were the advantage of the ultimate load method? There was a total safety factor which is nearer to actual value and the reinforcement required was very much less than the working stress method. The disadvantage of this was it was not considering the control on the deflection and the load factor is used only on the loads. It was not used on the material. The material is a very variable property which has got and it should be considered all these disadvantages of working stress method and ultimate load method was used and then it was rectified called as limit state method. We know from our study on statistics there is a word called probability. What is probability? I will give you an example. Probably today I will go to field if the weather permits the probability is 80 percent by seeing the morning sun you may say today I there is a probability that there is no rain in the evening. So, that means to say we are gauging by our statistics. If I have seen earlier the sun is bright in the morning there could not be in a particular season any rain in the evening. So, that is called probability. Assessing a particular aspect is called probability. So, I use in the limit state method probability that a structure will not become unserviceable in its lifetime. So, many buildings you must have seen recently in Bangalore during construction itself they have deteriorated and it becomes unusable. So, we should design the structure such that 
it is safe throughout its life. Generally, we design the RCC building at least for 100 years to live. So, the life of the structure should be 100 years. So, the probability is that the structure will not collapse for that 100 years the design what we have done. The structure should withstand the ultimate load and should also satisfy serviceability requirements such as deflection and vibration. So, we use the concept of serviceability in limit state which was not there in ultimate load method. All relevant limit states which I show you very shortly be considered in design. So, I divide the limit state into two parts collapse and serviceability. Collapse is the one which makes the building to completely come down, I cannot use it which are all the collapse can happen. It can have due, happen due to bending called flexure, maybe due to axial compression force, due to shear force, due to torsion. All this comes under collapse. Then the serviceability which I told you may be deflection. The building may crack, you must have seen many buildings which have got very wide crack width if the user or the one who is living inside a building see more crack, he will not be happy or he will not be satisfied with the building, he will not be comfortable. So, the crack width should be to a limit. So, that is given in serviceability and it should not vibrate. For example, in the first floor somebody walks, you should not hear the vibration in the ground floor because it will not give you any satisfaction about the ability of the structure to maintain the load. Limit state method has got different theories for different limit states. Working stress method is used for li serviceability limit state and other methods are used for the collapse. Ultimate load theory for limit state is used for collapse and then working stress for serviceability limit state. Stability analysis is done to check whether the building overturns or whether it slides and it provides unified rational basis because I am using the history of the structures which was built for long time. Now, if I go back to the earlier method which I showed you as a formula, if R is the resistance, L is the load, then I apply a factor called mu on R. Mu is a partial safety factor for material, lambda is a partial safety factor for the load. That summation shows different loads. For example, if it is dead load, lambda I is different. If L is dead load, lambda is different. If L is wind load, lambda is different that is why that summation is shown. So, for material the factor of safety should be less than 1. That means, if the material has got a capacity R, it should be designed in such a way that or it should be subjected to a resistance such that it is less than its actual value. So, that the building will be very, very safe and lambda we consider greater than 1 for the loads. That means, the load I expect will be more than actually applied and serviceability I calculate by delta by L. Delta is the deflection, L is the span. It should be less than or equal to 1 divided by a integer number. The limit state method is represented by the stress strain diagram as given below. It is a rectangular section which you can see here and the at the bottom the reinforcement is AST, the strain diagram is same. The strain which is got 0.2 percent will give the stress to be straight and then up to 0.2 percent from 0 it will be parabolic and then it will be horizontal like this. If you reverse this by 90 degrees, it is the stress strain diagram 
and the ultimate stress I take it as 0.46 FCK. Why that number 0.46 FCK? I will tell you tomorrow that is in the next class how that 0.46 has been worked out. So, we will uh, try to conclude today by going to the different uh, summaries I have made. All this I will tell you in the tomorrow's class or in the next class. I will now go to the summary of what we did today. So, today as friends we have understood in the beginning what is reinforced concrete, what is working stress method, ultimate load method and limit state method and the materials are assumed to behave as linear in working stress method and non-linear in ultimate stress method. In limit state method the concept of probability has been used and the structure should withstand the ultimate load and should also satisfy the serviceability condition. In the limit state I said mu r that is r is the resistance multiplied by the factor of safety which is less than 1 should be greater than the summation of factor of safety for load into the load. So, mu is less than 1 and lambda is greater than 1. For serviceability I use delta by L as the condition and 1 by alpha which I compare and I say delta by L should be less than or equal to 1 by alpha. Alpha is an integer number generally taken as 250 and L is the span. Rest of the things I teach you in the next class and have a good day. Thank you.